shared my secret punk rock past. In her rockabilly phase, she looked like a miniature Italian movie star circa 1959, but I knew better. It wasn't always that way. The mink swears I was the first punk rocker she'd ever met, that I changed her life. We would first bumped into each other two years previously in 1976 at Granny Takes a Trip. The trendy, world-famous glitter gone punk rock boutique had become famous on King's Road in London clothing everyone from Mark Bolin of T-Rex to the Sweet and Roxy music. They had just opened an offshoot store on Sunset Strip. Teenagers on leave from suburbia, the Minx and I arrived at the same time trying to sell t-shirts we'd made. Mine had dirty words stenciled in spray paint all over. Hers had two zippers down the front, which when opened would reveal the breasts. Initially, I looked upon her as my competition but her lurid blue eyeshadow, breathy voice, and tiny hands immediately enchanted me. Hang on one second, I have to get some water. I have um, Claritin cotton mouth. <laughs> Dainty and adorable, the minx was and still is one of those girls who'll never look like a woman. With unusually large doe eyes, a perfect tiny nose, and close cropped hair, she's the ultimate gamine. If you dressed her in a toga and put wreaths of flowers in her hair, or maybe added a set of gossamer wings, she could be reclining in a Maxfield Parish print. Compared to her stature, her personality was over the top. She's smart, brash, and vibrant, more like an idealized Japanimation character than a real person. She was fun in big, fat, primary colored Fisher Price letters. Letters with giggly eyes and little cartoon smiles. Fun like a tawdry carnival sideshow. Fun like an old time whorehouse that's always filled with drunken conventioneers and boxer shorts and fezzes. Fun like a dimly lit backstage of a rundown camera, a cabaret in the Weimar Republic. The Minx was always up for anything. We became fast friends, seeing each other regularly at the Whiskey at Gogo for Ramones and Blondie shows, at the Mask for Germs gigs, and at many drunken parties at the Canterbury Arms, a rundown apartment on Cherokee, just off Hollywood Boulevard. Lots of punks took up residence there because the place was cheap. They rented to anybody. It was full of junkies and hookers. The manager was running scams with the landlord and also probably running drugs. <clears throat> The elevators were covered with graffiti, constantly out of service. Rigs and beer cans were discarded on the shredded carpet in the hallways, which probably hadn't been replaced since the McCarthy era. The, appropriate, uh, the apartments themselves were great, or had once been, hey, could I get a little more light up here on stage? Is that possible? Kyle? I'll do it. I can't see where you are. Oh, you have to go over there? OK. All right. Let's go out to the lobby. Let's go out to the lobby. See, even my granny glasses. Were, this is good showgirl light, but it's not good reading light. See, photo up. Is that better? Yes, that's okay. better. Right, cool. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Okay, we're talking about the Canterbury. The elevators were constantly covered in graffiti, always out of service. Rigs and beer cans were discarded on the shredded carpet and in the hallways, which probably hadn't been replaced since the McCarthy era. The apartments themselves were great, or had once been. Big starlit singles from Hollywood's golden age. They all had built-in vanities and Murphy beds. There was typically a lot of Mickey's Big Mouth beer involved in the Canterbury shindigs. The stereo would be blasting the clash or the advert, adverts import 45s while people who were too young to drink legally locked themselves in the bathroom to do drugs. The walls at the Canterbury's kitchenettes were splattered from food fights with day old top ramen or craft macaroni and cheese. People were always passed out on the ratty sofas salvaged from the trash. Inevitably, a lot of drunken pogo dancing took place, and usually a Murphy bed would come down from its hinges and slam off the wall and onto some hapless kid's head. None of us had jobs because you couldn't get hired if you had pink or even dyed black hair in those days. Our clothes came from dumpster diving Salvation Army donation boxes, and we were always on the guest list for shows. As long as you had enough cash for cigarettes and beer, you were dandy. Nobody wanted a regular job anyway. It would interfere with the parties. 
We were wannabe musicians who were also painters, photographers, performance artists, clothing designers, writers, dancers, actors, and smart, though disenfranchised teenagers. There was also a bunch of older off-the-wall types, refugees from the Midwest and New York, ex-hippies from Haight-Ashbury, ex-beats from North Beach and Greenwich Village, and former superstars from Andy Warhol's factory. Lots of us had come from the glitter rock scene and so were comfortable with multiple partners and bisexuality. There are openly gay folks, but other those who were simply into experimentation, people who didn't really believe in labels or conventional lives. For a while at the Canterbury, there was even a frisky all-girl female club or gang, gang all the West Side Story, called the Piranhas. They were rumored to be a bunch of dykes, but were more like raunchy party girls, out for a good time and outrageous fun and sex with anyone cute who presented themselves. All of us were infinitely unemployable, and so we had to do something with our time. So we drank a lot, had tons of casual sex, formed bands, made Xerox fanzines, and drank and fucked some more. Everything trendy in New York, or especially London, had a huge influence on us. So when English punk started getting into teddy boy culture, listening to American roots music, wearing draped coats, suede brothel creepers and voluminous poodle skirts, we all followed suit. It was only a matter of time until it was de rigueur, darling, to have a rockabilly paramour. <laughs> Always a step ahead of the crowd, the minx and I swooped in and got the pink of the litter before any other punk hats got hip to the scene. Our boyfriends had migrated from London via New York's Lower East Side and were in the hottest and at that point only rockabilly band to hit the U.S making all the girls in the audience swoon the way the chicks did in those ancient newsreels about the devil's music. It was a novelty to stand at the mouth of the stage and see handsome guys in suits and string ties crooning love songs. Much better than standing safely away from a roiling mosh pit full of boozed up jocks who were slam dancing, or watching pasty skinned pimply guys covered in spit and beer screaming out one chord songs about war and the government with fake English accents. <laughs> Rockabilly was sexy. It was about being horny, not being on the dole. Punk chicks by the dozens were abandoning their Converse high tops in favor of saddle shoes, trading in their dead Kennedys t-shirts for bullet bras and tight cashmere sweaters, all to catch the eye of these cool hepcats. My cockney boyfriend Levi was a bona fide English Ted, and Dean, his drummer, whom the minx was seeing, originally hailed from Kentucky, giving him even more rockabilly cred. He had a bleached blonde pompadour and a sleepy Eddie Cochran smile. Our boys were in the band that was a toast of the town. We were madly in love with them and the envy of every girl who hadn't already been growing out her spiky green hair long enough to make a ponytail. <laughs> so there the Minx and I were at the PAL, already tipsy and excited because our hepcat bows were opening for Ray Campy and the Rockabilly Rebels. Stand-up bassist Colin Winsky was, no, stand-up bassist Ray Campy was a living legend, a Texan who'd been at it since the early 50s. His singer, Colin Winsky, was tall and loose-hipped with big sideburns and a cool yelping wail. Jerry Sikorsky, the lead guitarist, looked like a cross between a slightly wall-eyed blonde teddy bear and the blank-faced Barney Rubble in the Flintstones. But! He could do backflips and somersaults with his axe strapped on, not missing a note. Our guys were duly impressed. Of course there was an after party, and the Minx and I steeled ourselves for the inevitable. Hours and hours of the guys spinning rare 45s and one-upsmanship over who knew more facts about the obscure one-hit wonders who were probably now fat, old, John Deere cap and rednecks pumping gas in rural Arkansas. But, dutiful girlfriends that we were, we tagged along anyway. The party was at Jerry Sikorsky's place, a neatly kept post-World War II ranch house in the depths of the valley, where he still lived with his parents. They happened to be gone for the weekend, he said enthusiastically, so it would be possible for the guys to jam together. The mix and I could barely help rolling our eyes. These post-gig after parties had become a monotonous routine for our punkette souls, even though we wanted to be good girlfriends. It was hard to tell what was a worse fate standing around listening to the fraternity of drunken Sun Records wannabes warbling out Gene Vincent hits, <laughs> or sitting there unable to get in a word edgewise while they played the entire collected works of Bill Haley and the Comets and their offshoot band, the Jody Mars, 
I'm scratchy 78s while everyone argued passionately about the baseline. The Sikorsky house was comfy, homey, and cluttered. Hand crocheted Afghans draped the couch. A pile of family circles was stacked neatly on the oversized TV set. The supersized fridge was full of beer and things brightened up considerably when Colin passed a joint around while everyone plugged in mics and amps. Yay. <laughs> Bored already, I wandered through the house, impressed by the rampant normalcy. So inviting after staying at a series of punk rock crash pads where the main source of nutrition was ketchup and mustard stolen from Aki Dog. In the bathroom, I admired the ceramic angelfish figurines floating up the wall with a morbid fascination. The mink sauntered in, her crinoline swishing. I took a sip of the cocktail she offered while reapplying my Revlon cherries in the snow lipstick. It was the perfect rockabilly sex kit in shade, the ultimate in 50s glamour. I had recently switched from using the punk lipstick of choice, Art Maddox Black Orchid, which was only 49 cents at Woolworth. It was a deep matte burgundy suitable for extras in Night of the Living Dead, Puerto Rican drag queens, or those endless Canterbury parties. The minx powdered her nose and feigned a yawn as I lit a cigarette. In the den, our boys were murdering the Johnny Burnett trio's butterfingers. Together, we inspected the master bedroom. The double bed had a golden vinyl headboard and quilted yellow ochre satin spread. A pair of bifocal reading glasses and a dog-eared copy of Reader's Digest sat on the bedside table. I flopped onto the bed to adjust the seams of my house and the mink sat down next to me. Water bag. <laughs> I'm afraid to like leave this uncovered on here. Oh, it looks like it'll be okay. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Don't be afraid. I know, it's not vodka. What am I worried about? <laughs> The minx, <clears throat> okay, the minx powdered her nose and feigned a yawn as I lit a cigarette. In the den, our boys were murdering the Johnny Burnett trio's butterfingers. Together, we inspected the master bedroom. Oh, I told, I told you that. Anyway, I flopped on the bed to adjust the seams of my hose, and the minx sat down next to me. Glancing down at my black fishnets, which would have been much more appropriate for the Rocky Horror Show or a spread in a late 50s pulp detective magazine, suddenly everything became clear to me. All this rockabilly stuff was wearing a little thin. While the music was great, the teen idol stuff only went so far. Sure, our guys sang about backseat driving, movie sex, and burning desires, but all they ever wanted to do in real life was have a couple of beers and boast about the rare records they'd found at swap meets and junk stores. The biggest drag was that they were constantly telling you not to mess up their hair. Even during sex. <laughs> Carefully coiffed into brand new Rebel Without a Cause DAs and sculpted with Mary's pomade, the Rockabillies would spend hours hogging your bathroom mirror in displays of vanity that would have been off-putting even to Little Richard. <laughs> <laughs> the punk guys, I recalled with a newfound nostalgia, would let you dye their hair green, dripping crazy color all over their leathers on their bathroom floor. They'd allow you to put makeup on them and would dress up in your underwear, dancing around to Donna's summer disco songs. <laughs> they wanted to get wasted on hallucinogenics and have sex up against the dumpster in an alley, which might not have been the height of romance, but it was far more exciting than listening to a bunch of guys in sharkskin suits jabbering away about Carl Perkins and Ursula Hickey. The minx and I, it occurred to me, were just as trapped as real 1950s women. And it was only through obligation and loyalty that we found ourselves listening to endless sermons about the early days of Sun Records, dressed in our little Peter Pan collared blouses, playing Susie Hellmaker, Donna Reed, and June Cleaver rolled into one. On the outside, we appeared as atomic age arm candy. Inside, we were both secretly pining away for some good old fashioned debauchery. We really didn't want to be pretty, 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 pretty Peggy Sue. <laughs> Or the version of Deborah Paget, Elvis's love interest in the movie Loving You. What we really wanted was to be Priscilla Presley after Elvis turned her into a hooker-looking version of the Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> With gobs of black eyeliner, wearing Bob Mackie gowns and drinking champagne while the king got wasted on quaaludes and delighted and shot out TV sets in a Vegas penthouse. <laughs> For weeks, our old punk rock selves were coming back to reclaim our surrendered power and individuality. 
Slowly but surely, subversive black fish nets and garters started replacing our bobby socks. Ticking like teenage time bombs, our latent desire for something more decadent was coming to a head. The minx reached up to my face and gently wiped away a lipstick smudge. The next thing I knew, we were kissing. It was tentative for a moment, but got increasingly wild and passionate. Coming up for air, we shared a brief, charged glance. I reached across her to the lamp on the nightstand and switched it off. We resumed kissing. I gently pushed her down on the bed, and as they say in romance novels, she yielded to me. <laughs> <laughs> we writhed around, breathless. Her lips were pillowy. I tasted her recently applied lipstick. She kissed in a languid, leisurely way, like a courtesan in a harem. She tasted like a divine mixture of cinnamon gum, cigarettes, and vodka. Running her hands through my hair, her 50s crystal grandma necklace clattered against my teeth as I covered her neck with a flurry of love bites. My head was spinning from a combination of cocktails and lust. Suddenly, the mink sat up, grabbed my face, and whispered urgently, I fantasized about this for so long. Dumbfounded for a moment, almost expecting her to say she was joking, I stuttered, me too. <laughs> this has been a dream of mine, she said as she rolled over on top of me and started undressing me slowly. I felt goosebumps covering my entire body as her hands slid up my thighs, lightly snapping the elastic of my vintage garter belt. We fooled around for a long time, our purses, petticoats, and pumps littering the floor. We squirmed our way through the guys doing Billy Lee Riley's Flying Saucers Rock and Roll, Jack Scott's The Way I Walk, Warren Smith's Ubangi Stomp, and how utterly appropriate Buddy Holly's nasty jump blues about a cheating woman, Annie's been working on the midnight shift. <laughs> That was not only completely thrilling to be with her, we were both feeling an illicit, delicious charge, having sex on a pristine bed, our friend's parents' bed, in a suburban ranch house, knowing that our unsuspecting boyfriends were in the very next room, completely oblivious to what we were doing. It was fabulous, wanton, and dirty as can be. Finally, we both felt that we'd been AWOL for too long. I could hear my boyfriend and Colin belting out, Wake up, little Susie, by the Everly Brothers, so we took that as a call for Reveille. Giggling and conspiratorial, we buckled our, our push-up bullet-shaped brassieres and hit the bathroom to comb our hair and fix our smudged lipstick. The guys barely noticed as we waltzed into the living room, asking like perfy Eisenhower era housewives if anyone wanted a cocktail. It was as though during our secret encounter we'd slid into a private twilight zone of teenage lust, and our guys had no idea they'd provided the soundtrack. <laughs>